So the theme of our, of our call <clears throat> is staying loose and moving forward. And uh, I know that um, we're, in, we're, in day, we're in day number 11 of a national uh, virtual shutdown of, the, of business and of the economy. Hey, Ryan. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, angst going on nationwide. There's a lot of um, un uncertainty and, um, and anxiety mm -hmm. about, about what's gonna happen. Are people, are people gonna still have even basic payroll a month from now? And will the, will the unemployment system hold up? And I, I imagine if, if the government keeps on printing money, uh, we'll be happy campers as long as there's paper, huh? That's, that's, a, that's a very poor attempt at humor. But let me, let me see if I could, if I could set the tone uh, by, by sharing with you um, a, a couple of, a couple of uh, events or incidents that, that occurred in my life in the past 24 hours. I, I don't know if you all agree with me, but I see a lot of people reaching out. I see a lot of people um, extending their, their hearts and their hands to others who, who might not have done that in a different environment. So there's always gonna be good that comes out of negative, uh, negative events. So uh, I think last, last week I mentioned that I'm seeing people just jovial and friendly and gracious in the, in the grocery stores. And, and pardon me, but you are gonna hear my three and three quarter year old twins in the background. So we have, um, we, have, we have amongst everything that's going on in the nation, we have a move of my, of my daughter, her husband and the twins from Nevada to Pennsylvania over the next 30 days uh, where Stephen is, is gonna take up um, a role um, as, a, as a youth pastor in a church in Pennsylvania. So um, I'm going to have my babies in my house uh, for the next 30 days, which is, uh, which is amazing. And it almost doesn't matter what else goes on in the world. I got my babies under my roof. So um, we're going to have, we're going to have a good time uh, during those, those times. So please forgive some background noise that you may hear from time to time. Uh, reaching out in small ways. Uh, we got a phone call yesterday from, from a young lady. Um, and I, when I say young lady, she's probably in her mid to late 70s. And um, she called us up and said, can you guys do me a favor? And Evie said, well, of course we can. What is it that you need? She says, I need you to come over here and pick up a pie and a couple of pounds of cookies that I made for you. And I said, wow. This is the kind of favor that I love doing people doing for people because um, I mean she has she has a very very small one bedroom apartment in a in a kind of a senior uh, type community they they've shut down their community center they they don't get to have any meals together she's she's in her apartment she's got nothing better to do but guess what bake and uh, so she asked us if we would pop over. And we kept our social distance. You know, she she handed us these these wonderful Tupperwares that looked like they held ten pounds each. And uh, I'm saying, here's somebody who who on paper should be someone who's in need of help, and she's reaching out to help somebody else. And and I'm hearing this, and I'm seeing this, and I'm experiencing this over and over and over again. And I I I believe, and I would stake my life on on the idea that everybody on the call probably agrees with me and feels the same way and we'll be looking for opportunities to reach out and help other people. Uh, I, I think that's probably the most important thing that could come out of, of, a, of a catastrophe and a crisis like this. I, I don't know how many thousands of people have lost their lives because of this coronavirus. I don't know how many people will get sick. It, it doesn't seem to me like it's hitting every state equally. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the culture and, and how, how uh, in what close proximity people are to each other. So it, it seems like when there's a more dense population, there might be greater incidence of, uh, of infection. And so that's why we've all been, been uh, admonished by, by government 
uh, and by and by medical professionals uh, to stay indoors or to at least to stay isolated. I'm sure it doesn't help to get out and get some air, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, I've been having uh, intermittent phone calls um, from my backyard, even though it was pretty chilly yesterday, because I've got to get out and and see the sunlight, and I've got to get some air. And you know, I'm I'm realizing, and, and I guess this is just silly to to say I even realize it because we all know this. We are we are a social pe people. We were created to be in community with one another. We were not created to be, you know, living up in some mountain cabin all by ourselves and you know killing our own food and and, and fishing and and living as as uh, as individuals as rugged individuals. We were we were made to live in community. And objection. <laughs> Who is that? Who's that? That was me. I object to that uh, derogatory comment on the wonderful lifestyle. Sorry to interrupt. This is Mike Stevens, who lives on 40 acres in Plainview, Minnesota. And um, Mike, you still live in community. Yeah, I know you have to go a mile and a half to your neighbor's house, and life's hard sometimes, okay? But, but brother, you are a communal animal. And I see it every time I see that that lighthouse of a smile that comes on your face. So you can't tell me you're not a, you're not a, a person who loves and thrives in community. So anyway, we can, we can debate that all you like. There's, there's no time limit on this call. So if you want to hang in there, go to hour number two, knock yourself out. Um, I woke up to negative rates this morning. What in the world would, would negative rates mean? Well, it, it might mean that if, if negative rates um, continue, that the bank might be charging us to leave our money there. Um, I don't know anybody who would, who would make that decision to leave their money at a bank if they're gonna charge you, you know, a hundredth of a point or anything at all, even a dollar to leave, to leave your money. Um, because for, for now at least, there are, there are good options. Um, we're going to touch on some things that we, we talked about last week, and hopefully we're going to overlap just a little bit. Um, there, there are things that I think that are important and worth and worth repeating. So number one, we're, re we're recording this call. So if anybody uh, would like to have, uh, have a link sent to them to send this call out to somebody who, who might uh, be blessed or benefited by it, we're happy to send you the link. If, if there's anything that we mentioned during the call that you need a copy of, or you need a copy of the link, or you need a white paper or a resource or any kind of a reference, um, you need to, to reach out to us, call us, um, <clears throat> call us on our, um, on our individual cell numbers, which are listed on our website, uh, or just send an email to info at Alpha Omega Wealth, info at Alpha Omega Wealth and we will be happy to supply any resource that we have available. Um, and, and also to, to walk you through as, as much detail as we can to the extent of our, of our knowledge and experience. And if we don't know the answer to something extensively, uh, we're going to refer you to somebody uh, that we trust, that we work with personally. I'm not gonna refer you to outsiders who I don't know. So we're gonna refer you to, to resources and people with expertise in, in any given space. So um, I mentioned last week that, that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, was our illustrious president who in about 1933 uh, decided to confiscate the gold. What a, what a champ, what a hero, what an idea that was. But he did say, and I have to take the good with the bad, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something is more important than fear. Uh, nowadays, going to the, to the grocery store might be more important than fear. And I'll, I'll bet that we want to minimize our, our trips to the grocery store. Uh, we want to minimize our, our physical interaction with people. Uh, we've been, we've been um, advised to, to exercise social distancing, and uh, I'm sure that's going to be beneficial in the long run. But um, fear, fear in itself is not going to help anybody. Anxiety in itself, worrying in itself, is not going to pay a bill. Uh, it's not going to solve a problem. What solves problems is, 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 is humble minds, great minds, people of character, people of integrity, 
getting together and talking through issues and, and seeing how, how perhaps the, 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 the community genius can, uh, can step up and solve problems. And I, I already see instances of that uh, here in Las Vegas. And I've heard of instances across that, across the country where, where people are getting together and, and um, assembling their correct collective genius. I heard of uh, the Ford Motor Company um, stepping up and saying, you know, we can, we can manufacture um, what are those machines that help people breathe? Um, do I have everybody on mute? Ventilators? Yeah. yeah motor <laughs> company, Ford Motor Company stepping up and saying, um, we can make ventilators. So um, there, there are thousands of, of, of surgical masks being, being sewn together by, by people and, and voluntarily um, given to the organizations who need them, the, the medical personnel, the doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, et cetera. So anything, any, any small thing that you can do um, would be helpful. Now, somebody you know, mentioned to me that we've been through this before and, and I'm gonna repeat this. There's nobody on the planet, unless you're over 90 years old, who has been through any kind of a crisis like this. So if you go back to 1929, 90 years ago, um, 90 years ago, there may be some semblance of similarity between that time and the present time. The biggest thing is this is, this is artificially induced. It's, it's induced by, by fiat of the government um, out of their best wisdom and their best sincerity to say, this is what we think we should be doing. And unfortunately, that requires a lot of businesses to shut down and, and probably 3 million plus and probably more than that uh, who are going to be unemployed, either unemployed today or going to be unemployed in the, coming, in the coming weeks. So we haven't necessarily been, been through this, but we've been through a crisis before. We've been through emergencies before. And um, the most important thing I could do is, is, is to say... Uh, Let's continue communicating and seeing how we can help each other. I, I mentioned um, last week the idea of having ready reserves. Now, it doesn't do any good for me to say you should have six to 12 months worth of cash on hand if you don't have it. That's great. That's great advice for someone who's in a position of strength, who already has a business, who already has money in the market, who already has financial resources. For me to say, that to somebody who, who, who doesn't have a thousand dollars in the bank, uh, it doesn't do any good. But we're talking today with, with everybody and anybody and anybody who listens to this, to this recording um, may, may give some thought to that and say, you know what? I've really been heavily invested in X. I've been heavily invested in real estate and I haven't had balance. I've been heavily invested in the market and now is not the time to sell in the market. I've been heavily invested in my business, but I've always been cash poor and I've always had to rely on lines of credit or credit cards or SBA loans. So maybe, maybe the advice to keep six or 12 or 18 or 24 months worth of cash is advice that some people will take seriously. And, and I have to say, just like there, there are folks who, who live paycheck to paycheck, there are also folks at the other end and th those folks are employers. I spoke to somebody yesterday who's involved in a construction project in Las Vegas, which is so large that the construction project will continue uh, even during this crisis. And his question to me was, how much more money can I add to this life insurance policy uh, that, that I set up for him about um, seven years ago? And so I had to get back to the home office and, and the, the, uh, the amount is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there are people who have resources and they still need advice today. People are still calling today. I got emails in the last 12 hours. So since midnight, I got emails and texts from, from ordinary people who are saying, you know, I've got an extra $50,000 I've had on hand. I've had in cash. I've had sitting stashed in an emergency fund of some kind. I don't know if it's in their sock drawer or where they are. But they're saying, where is the best place to invest, quote unquote, this money in the near term? And I'll, I'll get with these people on a one-on-one -on -one 
And, and I'm going to continue to say everybody's situation is different. And so we're not going to give blanket advice and say, everybody should take the next $50,000 that they come across or the next $5,000 that they come across come across and put it in X investment or X savings account or X money market or X short term. All those decisions need to be made um, in conjunction with a plan. And the plan needs to, to involve dealing with the short term. And, and increasingly, I look at short term, and some of you are going to laugh at me, I look at the short term as the next five years. And I look at midterm as five years from now to 15 years, let's say. That's midterm. And I look at long-term, 15 years uh, plus. So the next 50 years, what should my plan be for the next 50 years? Now, some people will come to me with a, with a, 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 a negative or critical or cynical type attitude and say, I don't know if I'm gonna be here in 50 years. Listen, none of us knows that we're going to be here tomorrow, but we don't plan for just tomorrow. We still need to plan and have contingencies for 50 years because what if the worst thing happens and you live 50 years? You're going to, you're going to get to that point and say, gee, now I know what he was talking about. I should have planned. I should have had a plan of some kind which had some contingencies. Um, I'm going to... to um, to shift for just a second because I've had a lot of calls and emails this past week and, and, and folks are going to uh, bring this statement to me and I'm going to look at my notes here. So I, I've built up, this is a client saying, I've built up a sizable portfolio of life insurance policies. Um, and I understand that I can access the cash in a family banking scenario, but, but right now, um, I don't feel comfortable making my ordinary loan payments back to my own policies or back to the insurance policy, the insurance company, I'm sorry, that has my policies. Um, what are my options right now? So if you're a client who has been, who has been utilized in the infinite banking strategy along with us, um, you have a lot more options and sometimes more options than you realize. So I'll, I'll mention a, a few of those. And before I do that, um, Yvonne, did you want to, to jump in and say anything? Because I want to I want to give anybody and everybody a chance to, to throw in those questions up front. I also want to remind you. <clears throat> I also want to remind you that um, there's a chat box that you can write in questions. So if if I don't get to the questions in the next you know minute or two or five, then I'm going to ask Yvonne to kind of wave her hand and remind me that we have a chat box open. So. Uh, if you don't get to those questions during this call, uh, call or, or email, call me on my cell, 702-334-4440. And the idea of these calls, again, is, is to be a generic resource. It's not just for the clients of Alpha Omega Wealth. This is for anybody. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they have policies or investments or, or plans with competitors. Right now, we're not competitors. We're we're citizens of a community of 300 million people and, and job one is to help each other. So if you, if you know of somebody or if you were that person yourself who needs help of any kind, who needs individual um, quote unquote handholding through a situation, because, you know, while this coronavirus is happening, um, the rest of life is still happening. Um, I was also on the phone yesterday with, with a dear friend of, of ours, uh, a couple and uh, they are in a, uh, the university hospital in, in Iowa city, the Iowa city uh, university of Iowa medical center. And she's in there and she's 50 years old with uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. And um, she's in there for her third round of chemo in, I don't know, 10 weeks. So she's going through intensive chemotherapy and you know what? The coronavirus and the financial ramifications of the coronavirus really don't make that much of a difference to a person who's in stage four anything and who's going through chemo. So we need to, we need to keep our heads. But in the meantime, there's still practical things that need to be dealt with. There are bills that need to be paid. 
<clears throat> their the investment portfolios, financial accounts, um, policies that people have. So I've got this portfolio of, I'm sorry, um, while I, while I unmuted, yeah. I unmuted for a second and I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't give Yvonne a uh, chance to jump in. Yvonne, did you want to throw anything in as my, as my uh, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I just want to say that I feel like, right, um, we've said it before, right, the panic right now, it's our worst enemy. I think that information, education, reaching out to us or to whomever to be able to um, understand right, um, everything that's going on, but to really not make harsh or rush decisions um, and start either canceling or changing anything right now is just kind of a time to just kind of sit back and just understand what's happening and really, really talk to professionals and talk to and help clients um, to be able to make the right decisions on how to move forward. And, you know, all the clients that I'm talking to, um, I always, um, the initial conversations are in a state of panic, right? After we get done, they understand that it's going to be okay. But, um, you know, everyone just needs to really seek advice and try to figure out, uh, you know, what their best situation is going to be. <clears throat> For example, um, my, my personal CPA is a uh, former IRS auditor. So he uh, spent his entire career working for the evil side. <laughs> he worked for the IRS auditing Fortune 500 companies. He's got a, a great depth of experience. And now he's a retired IRS auditor and he works, he, he works as a partner in a local firm in Las Vegas um, named Campbell Jones Cohen. Now, again, you may be on the call and you have your own personal CPA. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not selling, I'm not recommending, I'm just saying, here's a resource. I noticed that the people who are, who are doing the most calls right now and the most webinars and the most conferences are, are the professionals. So the people who actually want the information, who can, who can gain an advantage, hold on. The people who can gain an advantage and who, who understand that during times of, of weakness in certain areas of the country, this is also time for opportunity. So um, Jack Cohen is, is hosting a webinar tomorrow, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And if anybody's interested in that link, um, I'm happy to send it to you. He's gonna be addressing um, primarily the disaster relief loan options Sometimes the, the phrase SBA is connected with these loan options. So for business owners whose intent it is to continue employing their, their team and keeping their employees on payroll, um, employers like myself will want to get on an SBA um, related webinar to find out what options they have to apply for loans. These loans are not free money. They're not giving this stuff away. As, as, as attractive as they make it sound when they're on television, um, it, it becomes a little bit more practical and, and, um, and maybe, maybe cynical um, when it comes down to applying. You do have to apply. You do have to provide finances. You do have to provide current balance sheets and income expense statements and tax returns that are current. Um, and uh, you do have to have collateral. You do have to have the ability to pay. This is targeted for business owners who want to borrow money that will be intended solely for keeping their, their payroll intact over the, over the coming months. And they're talking about lending us money on a 30-year mortgage. So basically what we're doing, those of us who, who, will, who will qualify, and I, haven't, I don't know if I've qualified yet because I haven't gotten the answer back. We haven't even finished our application yet. Um, the, the understanding is that it'll be a 30 year mortgage. It'll be approximately 3.75%, which is, which is a good rate, but it's money that for most cases will have to be paid back. There's some talk out there about, about forgivable loans. And right now um, that's talk. I don't know which loans will be for, forgivable. I don't know which loans won't. 
I know that the most important thing for me is to keep my business open. And it's, it's to keep my, my team, my, my employees employed and, and paid. And that means um, we have to have something to do <laughs> and we have to have clients to serve. So uh, we, we seem to have, have an ample supply of clients who, uh, or, who are happy to, to work with us and who are uh, loyal and have been with us, some of them for, for decades and decades. But um, so there's, there is one particular resource, Saturday, 10 a.m., uh, Campbell Jones Cohen. You can look them up on, on the website, on their website, Campbell Jones Cohen, CPA firm in Las Vegas. And I'm sure there are probably hundreds of webinars and resources like this. Again, if you need the information, um, let me know. What can I do with this portfolio of policies? I didn't even get to the answers yet. So the obvious answer is I can take a loan against the cash value. And, and you need to go into the depth of detail and, and get with us and find out exactly what your options are. Again, we've been working with clients under the infinite banking concept model for right at 20 years right now. And we still have clients that have had policies for five and 10 and 15 and, and close to 20 years under this model who still call us up or write to us and they don't understand what their options are. They, they are afraid of having to make an amortized, which means principal and interest, a payment or a loan repayment back to the insurance company. There are more options than that. So you could take a loan against the cash value and you will be billed for the interest on that loan. Now, now in the most fortunate example, I will, I'll say that I hope that your policy anniversary was March 25th, because if it was March 25th and you take a loan out today, you're not going to get an interest notice until next March 25th. That means you've got 11 and a half months of, of non, of non requirement to pay interest. You're going to have to pay the interest. I'm just saying you're not going to get billed in most cases until you're billed in arrears. So a year from now, you'll get an interest notice. It'll be interest only. So a hundred thousand dollar loan will require a, a five thousand dollar interest payment. A ten thousand dollar loan is going to be a five hundred dollar interest payment. You don't have to make that payment until a year from now. If if you actually have some free cash, you can start making that interest payment in advance. So interest only loans are, are the most obvious way that you can avail yourself of cash in your policies. And you can use those, in, those interest only loans to pay the premium on your policies. So what if, and I had this situation this week, a client called me up and wanted a $24,000 withdrawal for some reason, and it, it's up to her, this is her policy and she has the right to make this decision. It may not be the best decision in my opinion, but she still has the right to make it. She said, I want to take $24,000 out, but I don't want it to be a loan. I don't want any interest to accrue from it and I don't want to pay it back. What's my option? Well, a lot of our policies have very strong levels of paid up additions purchased by dividends. And I know that's a mouthful. So in effect, the cash value of dividends, or let's just call them dividends. You can surrender dividends in a policy without having to pay them back. When you surrender something, you're selling it. Okay, so if you have a stock worth $100 and you surrender the stock and sell the stock, there's no further, future, no further relationship. You can sell or you can liquidate or surrender some of your dividends in a policy. You don't have to surrender all of them. So in her case, she happens not to have a lot of dividends, dividends in her policy because she has a rather, a rather small policy that she had purchased before the, the, uh, the advent of banking. And so she has, has a policy that she's built up over the years and she has six figures of cash available, but doesn't want to take a loan. And I said, you can surrender some dividends or you can surrender all dividends. Now the other option is you could, you could take a, um, a contract reduction. This is a very radical, very severe, um, very one-sided, an irrevocable decision. So you can reduce your contract. Let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy and you want to reduce it and take cash out. Let's say that we reduce it down to fifty thousand dollar policy. You've just freed up half the cash to that policy. 
Now, there may, in very in, in a very uh, minute number of cases, there may be a taxable event there. You may have a very small amount of tax to pay on the profit over the basis because life insurance policies are, for the most part, um, tax-free or tax-preferred arrangements. And we always have to give this disclaimer, as long as you manage it correctly. I mean, you could, you could use anything improperly, right? You could use a policy improperly. So there are things that you can do that can cause you taxation if you handle a life insurance policy improperly. If you have a policy and you have it for 20 years and then you just cash it in, which is about the worst thing you could do, and let's say you put in $50,000 into the policy and you sell it for 60, you're going to have a ta taxable gain of $10,000. So in a very small number of cases, there are taxable uh, impact to people. But I'm not talking about all the nuances and all the ramifications of what can happen. What I'm talking about right now are, are numbers of options. So you, you can take loans, you can surrender dividends, you can reduce your contract. Um, now, this, this is even, even more of a negative uh, than, than previously, but you can borrow from policy A to pay for policy B. Is that a good idea? Well, if that's the only option you have, then it's probably, it might be a good idea in your case. Now, we call that, that that's, that's very, very similar to the idea of laddering. And that's buying policy A, borrowing against it, to buy policy B. We don't recommend that. We will, we will get fired from insurance companies for doing that. But I'm talking about an extreme situation where a client already has a portfolio of policies. And if you have to borrow from one to pay the other, and that's the only option you have on the planet, well, I'd rather you did that than you lose your policy. Now, there, there are some, um, some, some more creative things that you can do. If you're an older individual who has adult children, you may have a powwow with your family. Let's, let's say that person is me. And I've got one or more life insurance policies and I don't have the premium to pay uh, to keep that policy in effect. I may gather my children around me and say, how would you like to buy into a guarantee legacy, a guaranteed in inheritance that will never be pulled out from under your feet? Well, again, this goes to the, to the uh, ideal of being a member of a strong, loving family. You know, for a long time, I said that the most important financial tool you have, the most important financial resource, the biggest financial asset you have in your life is your earning power. And your earning power is, is a very important asset. It's probably the most important asset you own individually. But if you think about your family and your extended family, your parents, your siblings, your grandchildren, your cousins, your, God, your godchildren, the most powerful financial tool on the planet is the family because together we can do things that we cannot do necessarily as an individual. So what if I gather my, my children around and say, um, I've got a policy here, you know, it's worth half a million dollars to you kids at some point in the future. So it might be a good idea for you guys to, to step up and start paying some number so that you can support this policy because this policy is ultimately going to you. Now, um, we're, on the, we're on the vein, of, we're on the vein of, of paying for policies and keeping your policies um, in, in effect. So let me just unmute, see if there are any questions right now. And if not, I'll continue. I wanna jump in. You guys are all just busy writing notes. Okay, good. So there are some simple things that we suggest to people. And, and, and I'm not saying that these aren't things that people think about or don't think about. But I've had a client call up and say, listen, my annual premium just came due and I don't have the money for it. And I say, have you thought about paying monthly? changing your $12,000 premium to $1,000 a month or changing, changing your, your $3,000 premium to $250 a month, whatever it is. And the client says to me, and th this shows you sometimes how, how poor uh, a mentor I am, how poor a coach, because 
we have to repeat things over and over and over. I mean, you can't do, you can't do one push up and be in shape for life. You better do a couple of hundred push ups a day if you want to get your, your body together, right? So client says, I didn't know that I could pay monthly. Well, hallelujah. There you go. Now you've got, you've got something you didn't know before. We can, we can change your, your premium from annual to monthly. Um, you, you, can take, you can take a premium loan. You can use your dividend to offset your premium. What if your premium is $3,000 and your dividend is $2,000 and you only have to pay the difference? Well, there's, there's another option. Um, another extreme um, option that some people have taken, and again, there are a lot of things that I can explain to my clients because I want them to know their options. I don't explain them because I want you to take them. <laughs> uh, I explain them because they may be the, the last ditch um, solution that you have. There's nothing left to do but this. Well, then it may be something to consider. And one of those options is, is uh, taking a reduced paid up policy. So I've got some cash in my policy. I don't want to pay the premium next year. I can't pay the premium next year. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm unemployed, I was laid off, or even worse, I had to shut my business down and I won't be able to open it up again for at least a year or more. So I wanna take my $100,000 policy and, and take a reduced contract. So the insurance company will change my contract. There will never be any premiums due again. And if I, if I wake up one morning three years from now or five years from now and say, you know what? I'm in a better position now. I wanna restart those premiums, you can't do it. When you take a reduced paid up policy, it's a one way option, it's irreversible, and it's a contract change that the insurance company will do at your option. So um, do we recommend it as the first, first line of, of choice? Absolutely not. Um, the other thing that you can do is, is you can reduce your policy and not take a paid up policy. So you can take that $100,000 policy and reduce it, for example, to $50,000. And you can continue to pay the premium on that $50,000 policy. So, and I'll bet that there are some options that I haven't uh, thought about. And if, if so, when we go through an individual situation, um, we can go through all the options and make sure that we've explored every single option. Now, again, I have to say this, I'm not only addressing our clients, and I know we have a lot of our advisors on the call, I'm not only talking about your clients with our, with our insurance companies. We will help anybody who calls us. I've always said that. I've always had that philosophy for the last 44 years. I will help anybody who walks in the door, anybody who calls up. I don't care where they bought their policy. I, I believe what, when a client buys any kind of a policy, they deserve service for life. That's why they pay us what's called renewals or residual income as, as life insurance advisors, because they expect us to provide service for the client for life. And what I tell my clients is, if I happen not to be here next week or next year or five years from now, then someone on my team or someone at the insurance company will assign you a new agent. And you will have someone who's going to be diligent and attentive because you deserve it because that's the arrangement that we agreed to when you first bought the policy from us. So everybody deserves service and I don't care who they are. We are, we are in, the, uh, in, in the process of launching a website called policyrehab.com, policyrehab.com. see more and more information from that. Go live sometime this year. I don't know exactly when. But that's just for the purpose of, of people who have who have policies of any kind and have no idea what they have. They have no idea what their options are. They have no idea if their policies are current. They don't even know who their beneficiaries are. I've had clients call me when, when they were a part when they were party to a policy. They thought that they were the owner and they wound up not being the owner of the policy because it's possible that a company or a trust or another individual can be an owner of the policy where you are the insurer. So it's our interest to help clients get that information and find out. Sorry. 
mute everybody. And I still have um, something going on in the background. So I think it's, I think it's okay now. Okay, so we've had, we've had clients contact us. They don't know uh, anything that's going on with these policies. We will do our best to reach out to the insurance company and um, get information, uh, help you bring the policy up to date, help you maintain it. The last thing I want to have happen is to have a, have a person own a policy for 20 or 30 years and they wind up losing all the benefits because they lost track of how to pay for it. They lost track of the insurance company. They lost track of the agent. They didn't know what toll free number to call. That happens a lot when it comes to estate planning. And again, even though we're in a time of crisis right now, we're in a crisis in, in, in a certain aspect of the economy, uh, there are still things that need to be done on an everyday basis. People are still needing to keep their wills and trusts current. People need to have a current estate plan. And, and I'm fond of saying this is, this is a, new, a new pet phrase of mine. You need to finish your plan. You need to have all the bells and whistles in place. You need to have guardians for your minor children. And those guardians need to be people that you respect and share values with. And they need to be people that actually know that they've been nominated. So donate, don't nominate somebody as a guardian for your kids and, 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 and fail to notify them because you're saying, well, uh, I don't want them to know right now. If you don't want them to know right now, don't name them. So we need, need to name guardians for our minor children. We need to, need to name trustees for our, our trusts and executors for our wills. And they need to be people that are, that are adults who, who have their head on their shoulders, have a little bit, a little bit of sophistication and, and or can, will be teachable so that when, when our professional team gets around them, the lawyer, the accountant, uh, ourselves, the financial advisor, the investment advisor, that they will be able to probably take some coaching so that they can manage those funds properly for the benefit of the family. And, and I've spoken to clients all over the place who say, well, I named trustees 12 years ago, but um, you know, one of them died, one of them moved away, one of them was my brother-in-law, my sister's divorced from him, he's no longer a part of the family, and uh, I guess I should get around to uh, naming a more appropriate person. Yeah. You really, you really should. I may have my kids come in and give some, give some pointers in a minute if they wind up floating over here. Um, ready cash reserves, um, understanding what your rights, opportunities, and responsibilities are for employer benefits that you have purchased um, through your own payroll. So there are some benefits that employers provide. There are some benefits that you have purchased voluntarily, and they may be benefits that you can take with you. We call them portable. So you leave an employer and you wanna take those benefits with you. Some of those benefits are portable and some of them are not. Now is a really good time to dust off your employee benefit booklet and find out what benefits you own, what benefits you're paying for, and this is really important. If any of those benefits have equity that you can tap into because there are, there are some voluntary benefits that employees can enroll in that will actually build up cash value. And, and you, won't, you won't know these things unless you keep in touch with the plan and understand what your benefit book um, tells you about and allows you to do. So you need to get in touch with the human resources or a benefits person or the toll free number or the website. And again, if you need help contacting any of those entities, um, let us know and we'll, we'll help you get um, on the right path. I'm unmuting. Okay, I have, um, I'm looking for questions, comments, concerns, application. We've only got a few minutes left and, and it's, it's okay if we don't go to exactly to the hour. Um, I want this to be, to be an open conversation. Um, I'd sure like you to invite your friends, your family, your, your neighbors, um, your, your grandparents, 
I don't care who gets on. We're happy to answer questions. So I'm opening this up to other agency directors around the country because I'm sure that some of them are thinking about having calls like this, but they haven't gotten around to it. So help me out here. Question? Say, hey, Joe. Sir. Um, this is Paul. And I, I was I was interested in, in asking um, since I'm a client of yours. Um, oh, that Paul. Yeah, that Paul. Yeah, big big bro. So, um, and I know that you're you're speaking with agents on this call and so on. Have you in any way communicated with your clients to talk about uh, obviously the issues at hand with respect to the virus number one, and expressing concern and so forth, but in an attempt to communicate with respect to the, all the issues that you've been talking about that are stressors for these people, whether it's estate planning, whether it's investments, whether it's, you know, somebody needs a, a cash uh, outlay at the moment. Um, these folks could be sitting around the table knowing who you are as their financial planner, but maybe don't know how to ask the right question. As, as you pointed out, you know, a few times during the course of this, this meeting and, and last week as well. And I did listen to last week's session yesterday. Oh, wow. Thanks. So um, is that something that you would do? I mean, if you have, let's say, for argument's sake, a thousand clients, would you consider writing to those folks, you know, expressing concern and encouraging them to reach out to you? Because you've said that a number of times during this discourse that, you know, they need to reach out to you for whatever the purpose, and you'll respond accordingly. So, you know, how, how do you make that connect? And I'm sure given the number of folks on the call, that has to aggregate the thousands of people, whether that's a practical approach or not, I'm not sure, but, you know, with technology and, you know, emails and so on, you know, banks communicate to their clients. And, and right now the, <laughs> the thing that banks are telling, at least in, in my case, my former bank, well, you can call for an appointment because the banks are closed, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that's nice, but people are probably a little um, inconvenienced by that, but they, they understand the reason for it. And I just, again, I don't want to go on and, and take up more time, but that's basically the essence of, of my, my question and my, my position. What is the communication aspect to your client base? So we're, we're doing everything that we can think to do. Uh, we're sending out um, Eventbrite invitations to the entire database. We're set, setting out uh, separate um, communications to investment clients and separate communications to clients who have life insurance or disability or annuities, other insured type products. And, and we're, I mean, we're opening up the floodgates for anybody who wants to make, make an appointment. So, as, as usually happens, um, the folks who, who, who engage with us most frequently are going to be the people who connect with us and say, I'd like to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, the one-on-one -on is going to be like this. It's going to be on screen. Um, I did have a gentleman last Friday, 88-year-old uh, client who's a, a very high-profile, um, highly funded client. He's got millions of dollars um, in different, different assets. And he insisted on having um, an in-person meeting at the lawyer's office. I was going to just be there as, as, a, as a counselor, as, as a, an informal a friend and advisor. And, um, you know, we, the, um, the attorney announced to him that we're not, we're not having in-person meetings. I was going to go out on a limb and show up at that meeting as, as an accommodation to, to my client. Uh, between you and me and the lamppost, I wasn't crazy about doing it, but I was going to because, by the way, he's 88 years old. Sure. At, the, at, at the last minute, the law firm said, I'm sorry, we're closed. And we can have this meeting by phone, and we're all totally available to do this by phone. He just wasn't comfortable having a meeting by phone because it was kind of a complex issue. So um, if, if there are ideas that any of you have <laughs> that we haven't, that we haven't um, tapped into yet, I am completely open because... I'll give you an example. We, we have clients and policyholders 
who bought policies 25 and 30 and 35 years ago, who have changed their phone number, who don't have email, who, do, who have changed their address, and we have a hard time reaching them because we don't know how, because they, mm -hmm. haven't, they haven't given us change of address. So we're frustrated because these people deserve service <clears throat> and they deserve access to information. And we, we send um, a forward request um, postcards and so forth to get their correct address and we do everything that we can possibly do to keep in touch with them. We'll, ha we'll have phone meetings, we'll have conference calls with other advisors, which is something I, I encourage my clients to do. You know, let's have a meeting of your brain trust every so often. The bigger, quote unquote, the a client is financially, the bigger the brain trust they have. They might have an accountant and an investment advisor and an insurance advisor and a lawyer, maybe multiple lawyers, and we'll have those, those meetings on a periodic basis as, as often as the client wants to. I, I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, it, and now I have a clear understanding it's in, in terms of exactly what you're doing because, again, there might be those folks out there who are reluctant to reach out, but if they see that their financial person and manager is reaching out, I think that's a big deal. Again, you know, you have a lot of paralysis that's taking place, I think, right now because of the uncertainty. And yes, it's the folks who are up there in age. And, you know, I'm, I'm there myself, so I understand it. And um, it's, it's tough times. So it, it, the, the more engaging you can be, I guess, the more comfort you'll, you'll create with respect to your client base. I appreciate you saying that. And the one apology I have to make is that I was, I was hoping that I would have had the opportunity to introduce my brother properly. But the gentleman who was just speaking is Paul Pantosi. He's my, he's my just older brother by five minutes. And, um, and he's, he's, he's a mentor and a, and a big brother. And, um, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say my idol uh, for my entire lifetime. And, and oh, by the way, uh, when he retired, he was the president, chairman, and CEO of the Provident Savings Bank that he, uh, that he basically ran for the last 20 years of his career. So he knows a little bit about banking. He spent one, he had one employer primarily for his entire uh, working career, 50 years at one bank. And um, he, he did an amazing job of growing and, and running and leading and mentoring that bank uh, up to and including taking them public uh, in 2003. And I still have the video of your interview with Maria Bartiromo and, oh, really? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you throwing the hats out from the podium at the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. Um, so I'm so glad you're on the call because well, thank I you for those kind to... words. I'm sorry. Thank you for those kind words. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you your, your two cents, uh, your opinion about negative rates. You know, the first I heard of that was when you mentioned it um, today. So I must have missed it on, on uh, TV. Nina was, is in the middle of a, a, a yoga class being transmitted from North Carolina. And, and the dog was in my face most of the morning. But, um, you know, I mean, that's, it's something that we haven't really experienced in, uh, in a real long time. And I, I think it would be a mistake if, if banks start charging anything. I mean, they may have to just suck it up you know there's going to be some relief in there for the, the smaller banks community banks with respect to this bill um you know something that they've been lobbying for for a number of years now so they think that the, uh, the reduced reserve requirements should help them and i think for the most part your your folks are probably dealing with a lot of the community banks as well you know the chases and the wells fargo of the worlds i mean you know i can't feel sorry for them they, they, can, they can suck it up and deal with it, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they will. Um, they're not going to have a choice. You know, I mean, people can vote with their feet. You know, the, my, my predecessor said that after every board meeting. You know, you, you have options, and, and that's the way you should roll. So th that can help some institutions, and it may hurt some institutions. Mm. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, this will pass, but will be uh, will be a different economy and a different environment for the next number of years. We're going to have some scars. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks, for, Paul. Thank you so much for being with us.
Oh, great. Uh, my great brother, my brother lives in, in, um, in Florida. Is that South Florida? Yeah. Yes. Palm beach County. Palm beach County. Lives in a, in a beautiful, a beautiful area. And, uh, I can't wait till they lift this, uh, this social distancing so that we can get on an air- airplane. So one of the things that, that has been really paramount in my mind in the last few days is the issue of people calling up, clients calling up and saying, okay, I've got some money and I want to jump into the market because it's low. Now, when, when we sit down with a client and discuss uh, an investment strategy, um, one of the most important thing that I could talk about w- with, with you as, as an investment client is talking about expectations. And so the same folks who want to jump in this week because, because the market has tanked over the past week or 10 days and has lost roughly 30% of value. And those, those same people who want to jump in and, and take an advantage, quote unquote, of the market, what they're really looking for, and they may not express it this way, they're really looking for a short-term gain. And so the folks who are looking for a short-term gain are going to be very disappointed. They're going to be very disappointed if they jump into the market with me or with anybody else to, uh, to try to, to capture these, long, these short-term gains that they, that they think that they're uh, looking for. They'll be very disappointed to find out that the market stays in the doldrums for the next year or two or three. Now, if you look at, at, at the big market um, corrections, if you want to call them corrections, in 2001, in 2008, in 1987, when we had huge market corrections, those, um, those in- incidents in the market took literally years to recover. And in some instances, took a year and a half to two years to recover. So that same person who, who might be thinking that they're going to capture a short-term gain by getting in low, and they're looking for some rate of return. See, that's their focus. Their focus is rate of return. My focus and our overall philosophy is focusing on the long term. Because we know that over the long term, and I mean long term, you will probably realize market gains if you stay in the stock market. I mean, you know, one of my, one of my, um, one of my people on, on the hero shelf is, is Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett is, I think, near 90 years old. And he says, I don't have a market perspective. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the market will do next year. I don't know what a given company will do next year. So what I do is I look for companies whose fundamentals are super, sound and i take a long time investigating them and then and then i buy a, either a near controlling um, percentage of the company or i buy the company and so the, the idea there is buy and hold generationally so it might be a good idea to think about not what the what the market is going to do short term if it's a good idea to get in the market it's a good idea to get in the market and stay in the market don't look at the stock market or this, this so-called opportunity uh, as a chance to spin the roulette wheel. And I'm, I'm not a very, very astute gambler, even though I live in Las Vegas. I don't know gambling very well, but I know what a roulette wheel looks like. But don't look at this as an opportunity to spin the roulette wheel and, and make a 10 or 15% gain because the market looked at you, at you favorably. Those are the same people who will actually get out too soon when they see the market taking a dip or making a correction. And, and, you know, nine times out of 10, when you try to so-called time the market, you're going to be disappointed because nobody has ever been able to time the market. Think about people, you know, and we all know somebody who's a day trader. Now, those are people who have a day job, they have a job that they go to, which makes their primary income, but they've taken a certain amount of money and they've dedicated it to to trading. And the statistics are that 95% of day traders lose all their money, all. 
And so the, the idea of, of a day trader, and this is just speaking ge generically because I, I know somebody, he's a, he's a personal friend of mine who lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, who does day trading and who actually does a pretty good job of it. Maybe he's one of the 5%. But he limits his investment and he limits his losses and he limits his gains. He looks to collect about $5,000 a month through trading. And he, he puts himself in a very narrow window, window and he gives himself parameters that he sticks to and he has a philosophy and he has rules. He has the method, he has a process. So I'm very concerned when somebody calls me up and says, I've got 50,000 or 100,000, I wanna jump in now those would be the same people who want to jump out at some expected hypothetical time when they've accomplished a 10 or 15% gain. You know what's going to happen? They're going to get out of the market with their 10 or $15,000 gain, let's say. And they're going to look for another opportunity that's going to be short term again. It's, it's kind of like the difference between people who invest in real estate and they invest in flips. So they buy a house at the right price, they slap a coat of paint, they do some very minor repairs, and then they sell it for a short-term game. Ho hopefully, hopefully they sell it after one year and a day and they get capital gains treatment as opposed to selling it inside a year where they get ordinary income treatment. But I'll compare the flipper, the person who buys real estate to flip and flip and flip and flip and create short-term gains, relatively short-term gains. Compare that with the, with the Kiyosaki type philosophy where he just buys apartment buildings and he buys rentals and he buys rentals and he creates more and more cash flow. So if you read Robert Kiyosaki, or if you know of him, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you should read Second Chance by Robert Kiyosaki because he talks about buying all these rentals because, because rental real estate, and I'm not a real estate agent, so I'm not selling anything. but but cash flowing real estate will will hopefully create cash flow over a long period of time and and i haven't seen rents go down even during market corrections even during recessions so the idea with with investing which is the management that we do or buying secure uh, insured type policies and annuities insurance type products products with guarantees the idea is is to, to buy them with, with a plan in mind and to hold them for a long term and to build up a wealth strategy and a generational wealth strategy and that will, will see you and your generations in the future. And, and I have to add this, the idea of infinite banking also involves teaching your children and your grandchildren the philosophy and the model and the mechanics and the reasons why. So hopefully we've helped you today. Um, hold on a second. Um, I have a question here. Curious if, if with your clients say they have access to cash in their life insurance policies at 5%, but they access, have access to a bank loan at 3%, would you ever recommend they use the bank loan? Thanks for the question. And I apologize for not, not looking at it um, before now. So at the end of the day, there, there, there are no absolutes. You have to compare every aspect of, of, of those two elements. You have a 5% life insurance loan and you have a 3% possibly amortized loan with a bank or another lending institution. So I, I would want to know if that 3% loan is an interest only loan, if it's a, if it's a seven year arm as in, as in a, a home mortgage, if it's, if it's an amortized loan, it, it might, might not be adv advantageous compared to an interest only loan with a life insurance company. What we're comparing are, are two different animals. They're, they're not always perfectly comparable because a life insurance policy loan will always be an interest only loan and the life insurance company cannot pull or close that line of credit. Whereas the bank is typically going to ask for new financials Either, either annually or periodically to some extent. And I've seen this happen over and over again where lines of credit do get shut down. But if you're just looking at the surface, if I were comparing two identical in, in every other aspect, two identical loans, sure, I'd rather take a 3% loan than a 5%. But you have to look under the, under the hood and see what other details um, we should also consider um, when making that, when making that uh, that choice.
appreciate your question. Um, we are going to continue to invite. We're going to continue to have these calls next Friday at 10 o'clock. And um, if you have, if you have um, anybody you know that who should be on the call, which I think everybody should be on the call, if you have topics or specific issues or questions that should be addressed, uh, email me during the week or call me during the week or, or discuss it with me during the week. And we're happy to get back on uh, next week. So if anybody has anything for the last uh, few seconds, I'd be happy to, to open the mic for a second. <laughs> I have one comment. Faith, hi. Can you hear me well? I can. Okay, good. Um, hello. It's good to see you. It's good to see everybody, you know, even if we are in our homes. Um, the one thing that I wanted to mention that's an option um, that I have tried is if you're making your loan repayments, instead of sending them to the company, you can set up a separate um, account, like a separate savings account within your account at the bank and have your payments go there and be saved there. And then when your um, insurance payment or your entire payment that you want to put there is due, you can send it there at that time. But during the year, if you need that money, you can access it from that separate savings account where you're putting your loan payments. All right, that's a really good point. Uh, I didn't even I didn't even get into that uh, into the the details mm -hmm. of of managing your own private family bank and faith. That's a really good point because we actually do talk about that all the time when we're coaching a client to set up a, a private banking system. What what faith is referring to is what we call a segregated account. And that is an account that you're using to do your own private family banking bookkeeping where you may not want to send a monthly payment to the insurance company. So if you're sending principal repayments to the insurance company to, to reduce that policy loan every single month and you under, you realize that you may need some access to some of that money within a few months, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to send it to the insurance company and then ask for another loan again. Of course, you can you can get all the loans you want but from a practical basis, you want to have um, access to short-term cash. Mm -hmm. So we can we can discuss that, and I'll be happy to discuss that in detail. And I'll put a diagram up on the up on the screen to discuss that in detail um, at, at the next call or in subsequent calls. Thanks for that. I appreciate it, and I uh, hope you and your family are well. Yes, you we are. Your, thank you. You and your eight babies over there, <laughs> over there in Parab Faith. Um, and Kenneth, they're about uh, about 50 miles from us over the over the mountain. Short drive. It's a difficult drive during the winter when it's snowy. Yeah. Uh, but they've been friends for 10 plus years. Anyway, great to see you. You too. So, thanks, guys, for for being on the call. Um, jump in next week. Invite your friends. Um, let them know we're not going to bite them. We're not going to sell <laughs> them anything um, unless they really, really need something. But we're not going to do that in this call. In providing a resource and helping you get it, get your 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 mental juices flowing, so that you can uh, deal with the, the challenges that are facing us today and in the coming days. I wish you all the best. I want to say God bless every one of you. Uh, you know how much I care about you and I'm concerned about you. And anything that we can do for you during the week or at any time, uh, please get in touch with us. Have a great a weekend. Be safe and be healthy and take care of each other. Talk to you soon.